for me, will be the last class in this semester because Brother Lumen will be coming and he'll be teaching next week all week long. I wish my wife was in here to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure that's going to be the case. Um, so, <clears throat> instead of starting a new chapter, like I would normally, I don't want to start this next chapter that I'm going to get into until I have a consistent period of time that I can share with you in that chapter. Um, another consideration about the next semester is that it's going to be shorter for me because I'm going to be traveling a lot. So I'm going to be missing quite a few days. <clears throat> um, but I will continue 1 Corinthians next semester, even though it'll be maybe half of what it normally is, or maybe a little more than that. <clears throat> um, and that's one reason why I'm going to continue it is because I have more, and there's, and it doesn't necessarily require a whole semester. So I'm looking forward to the, the last part of this next semester. <clears throat> so tonight, what I want to do is I would like to go back over uh, one little portion that we hit, but we didn't really, uh, I was sort of moving quickly at that time. And so I want to I want to go over that again, and that part is in First Corinthians chapter four. So if you'll turn with me, First Corinthians chapter four, <clears throat> and I'd like to say hello also to my good friend Robert. Hey, man, good to see you. Love you. Good you Always good to see you. Love your heart for Jesus, brother. <clears throat> Well, that's, I, you know what, I agree with that. I think we need to encourage one another from time to time. And, and, uh, but you are a blessing to me. But you, you know that. You know that we have a good, <laughs> we got a good thing going. <clears throat> All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Primarily, I'm going to focus on just maybe three verses <clears throat> here. Um, but I will recover a couple of the other verses that are in here. <clears throat> so let's, let's look first at verse, uh, well, let's read verse 15 through 17. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me, for this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. <clears throat> um, the first thing to notice here, and, and I'll be honest with you, this verse is kind of personal to me, in that uh, at the end of verse 15, Paul says, for in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. <clears throat> and the sense that I get from that is not that he's talking about why well, I led you to the Lord. In fact, I don't even know that they led people to the Lord back then the way we do in the sense of, of the way we go about it. Um, but, they, but Paul would begat people in the gospel. You see the difference? I mean, he didn't begat them to salvation, but he got them to the, begat them to the gospel. And, um, and in that spirit, there would be those who related to him and who sort of knew him as their father in the Lord. Does that make sense? And um, 
<clears throat> and, you know, I know that there are people here in this fellowship and <clears throat> even in this Bible school who look at me as their father in the Lord. <clears throat> and and uh, that's, to me, that's something different. And I think that Paul's trying to make that difference here. I don't want to make a big deal out of it, and I don't want to lift up anything in relationship to that as much as to stick with Paul's emphasis here and what exactly he's trying to communicate. <clears throat> For though you have 10,000 instructors, you have not many fathers. And from the very onset of that, you see that Paul puts the issue not on the message, 10,000 instructors, you see what I'm saying? Or what he's saying? <laughs> the emphasis is not on the message. That's a lot of instructors. <laughs> you know? That's a lot of people that can teach you the message. But he says you have not many fathers. You have not many fathers. And that, in contrast to... Uh, 10,000 instructors in contrast to the issue of trying to get you to get the message is um, on the nature. A father begats a son after his own nature, after his own way. It's like a father, uh, if you will, fathering seed, a certain kind of seed, uh, and so when he says the gospel, <clears throat> I don't believe Paul is just talking about the, the teaching part of it, the explanation of Christ and him crucified, or the explanation of us being crucified with Christ, or the explanation of all these things. And, and thank God, thank God we got people giving explanations and stuff. <clears throat> but Paul is appealing to something here. Um, because there are issues that are going on in this church. And um, I feel his fatherly heart. I feel his, um, his approach when he first came to Corinth, that it wasn't to just teach them truths, that it wasn't just to make sure that they had in verbal form received the gospel, but that something had happened in him, something in relationship to Christ crucified, something in relationship to a spirit and to a nature that transformed his life, and he set out to impart that spirit. It's the only way I know how to put it. That spirit. And for him, the, of, of getting into all these issues that are in Corinthians, he's trying to show that I'm not trying to instruct you as far as issues. He's in every one up to chapter 4, and we know it, it goes on, He's trying to bring them back to the heart of the gospel by, in nature, knowing that if they receive Christ crucified, not as a teaching, but as a spirit, as a nature, as the, the way in which they are to proceed by life, then these issues will easily be dealt with. But if they can't, Embrace what they were birthed out of. If it's all just up in their heads. If it's all just um, subject to change based on new issues. Well, I, there's a new issue that came up and I don't see how that fits. You know, something like that. They would think that. Whereas to see Jesus... And to see Christ crucified and to, to not try to work him into a teaching, but to grasp 
And, and I'll put it like this, and we've done it in the past in this very teaching here, uh, this very class, to grasp the crucified one, to look beyond the benefits of what came to us, all of which can be categorized and, and, and separated into areas and divided up and then brought back together in a grand teaching scope that we can say, I understand Christ crucified, but not that, but to look at Christ, the crucified one on the cross and to comprehend the very spirit that took him there. Not just the sin or the failures of man or the failures of the world, but his selfless, self-giving spirit that literally as God was willing to, to um, come down, become like the very creatures he created, man, and then get lower, become a servant, and then get lower and become, a, as it were, a criminal that was hung between two thieves and was guilty by association as well as all of the false accusations that were laid on him and him knowing all that's going to happen. And him taking that lower seat anyway because of something that can't be described in the word selflessness. But it is selfless. But it can't be truly, it can't be tasted in that word. You can only hear it. Or the word sacrifice, which is you know, uh, very disturbing because then we're going to live sacrificially instead of Christ crucified. And uh, I just see that he, he, um, he saw Jesus. He really saw Jesus. And um, it just changed him, just affected him from one pole to the other. It just, uh, he just would not be satisfied in living the way that he did before, which was quite grandiose. I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was out distancing his brethren in the, in the ministry, as, it, as the true translation there in Galatians is. But he, like Jesus, stepped down out of that. And you find that, that picture, um, for example, in the middle of verse 9. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak but ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised. And, and you know, all of this should, and I, I, you know, should hearken us back to the first chapter where, you know, you could flip over there just for a, a brief uh, refreshing of uh, the first chapter and, and um, um, verse 19, for, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And, and I remember years ago reading that and thinking, oh my God, he's not talking the way nominal Christians do today. He didn't say, I will destroy the sin or I will destroy the wicked or I will destroy the, I mean, you know, all the things that where Christians would go with, with God doing a great work against the enemy, he said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And, and as you know, this because we've covered this, it goes through this chapter and into the next chapter and into the next chapter until we get to four where we've been reading tonight. And there, in these verses, we see uh, that God... I'm going to say it like this, but it's going to sound real strange. God is at war with the wisdom of this age, but the, the way he's fighting that battle is the cross, which is the wisdom that was before the age, as it says in chapter 2. And so you see, uh, as he goes on down, <clears throat> verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. 
unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Gentiles foolishness. And Paul in chapter 4 is thinking how foolish Jesus set himself forth on the cross to declare the power and the wisdom of God by Christ crucified. That's what he said we preach, Christ crucified. And how Paul stepped down from his place of honor, of respect, of financial viability, and became foolish. You are wise, but we are foolish. You are strong, but we are weak. He's, he's embracing to the depth of his core Christ crucified. He sees that what happened to Jesus wasn't a happening. was number one the way of God in selflessness and number two it was the way that God expects us to live also um, <clears throat> then in verse 25 because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye, verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren. And, and there he begins to set forth Christ crucified in the manner, and, and consider this, in the manner that he is to be lived, in the manner that the ministry is to be formed out from it. All of that he is considering as the standard by which you judge Christianity. By this shall, you know, shall all men know that you are my disciples because you have love and the love that he's described there is um, that he laid down his life for us. And he, but, he, but he wasn't a martyr. He wasn't a martyr to do that. It's a difference. Because there's a lot of glory that goes with a martyr's death. There's not a lot of glory that goes to Christ crucified's death. All right, again, as I say every class and will probably on and on, um, my little uh, warning at the warning label on this, uh, especially for people on Skype, don't try this at home. We are trained professionals here. <laughs> and then I say to you that are here, don't try this here. I'm a, tra I'm a trained professional. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen him like I want to. I haven't seen him like I need to. But I've seen him enough to know how it is that I'm going to live. And um, so uh, you must not receive my teaching as something that would be laid upon you. Only that if something rings true in your heart, that you yourself, well, get on your knees and, and open the word and just say, Father, open my eyes. I would see Jesus. And, and, um, and pursue. But the, the wisdom of this age will keep us from pursuing this because this is foolish. Foolishness. So only, only those upon whom the Spirit of God has touched their being, would I even, in my, <laughs> my little bit of authority, would allow you to even embrace such a 
madman's teaching, Paul and then mine. <clears throat> I don't recommend it. I, I, I recommend it only if you see the Lord. But it is, you know, and I know you've heard this before and you're probably getting real tired of me saying it over and over. But, but uh, uh, again, it has nothing to do with you or your capacity or how much you know the Lord. It has everything to do with the vastness of the gap between the hidden wisdom of God that was hidden from before the foundation of the world and the wisdom of this age that promotes itself and that wants its own way and wants God to, to be basically their servant. Lord, serve me. You know, protect me as I go down the road. Bless my finances, everything else. And I, I have no problem with protection and I have no problem with finances. I have a problem with a spirit that really basically puts God in a position that he ought to be serving us, watching our every need, looking and going order to order, instead of us giving up to be able to find the true thing of his heart that I believe, and I think Paul believed, is only found at the cross, where you, you truly begin to know God as the crucified God in, in spirit and nature. And um, that, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, he, he placed himself. He, did, he wasn't forced into it. He placed himself as a fool. And they placed themselves as wise. He placed himself as weak. He was in a position of strength. And placed it like Jesus, like Christ crucified. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here, that this is, this is what he did. And he placed himself as despised and not honorable. And who in the world is going to choose such a thing? I'll tell you, fools. Or at least they appear that way. You see, because that's what he says. <laughs> and he says, we are fools for Christ. I mean, at least if we're going to be a fool, let it be for Christ. Amen. And again, being a fool for Christ is not somebody out on the streets, you know, with a big sign that says, come to Jesus, jumping all around and laughing hilariously and saying, I'm just a fool for Jesus. Come to Jesus. That's not, that's really not what Jesus did on the cross. <laughs> So, um, however, I'm not against that, and I'll probably do it if I hadn't already. I'm pretty sure I did it in my Jesus freak years. Being despised, he says. Being reviled. We bless. Okay. Okay. If you put that in the real world with your circumstances and people around you and stuff like that, then it gets tough. If we can keep it up in a doctrinal thing where it never really sees, where we ever really see where it applies to us, we only see where it applies to Jesus, we behold it as beautiful. Do we not? It's beautiful. It gets ugly <laughs> when we apply it to our life. And I understand that. I have a life. Believe it or not, I have people that despise me and revile me. But I would rather have Jesus than the satisfaction of reviling back. You know? I mean, and not everybody's in that place. Do you understand that? Do, and, and I don't condemn, again, I don't condemn you if you're not in that place. In fact, I'll tell you what I do. I'll love you, and then I'll die, and, you know, hopefully God can release some more of that towards you. But there is no condemnation on my part. There's only the hope, just like Paul, that if, I have, if, I, if I've just been a teacher, if I've just been an instructor, then you got 10,000 of those, and I mean nothing in that sense. And I'm not talking about me per se, but I'm saying, but if I, have be, if I have begotten you through the gospel, then we're of, we're of one spirit, even if we don't act like it right now. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Because kids have to grow up, right? 
They're not, you know, perfect little angels, despite what some mamas say. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> this, this way is the way of Christ crucified. It is the way, it's the way of the Lamb. It is the way of the Lamb of God. <clears throat> and uh, let's go back to uh, chapter 4 <clears throat> and verse 15. <clears throat> For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ I have begotten you through the gospel. You know what I hear Paul saying? And you know, what, you know what I hear Jesus saying through me to you? Paul is saying, you are more than students. Particularly here in this Bible school. You are more than students, he's saying. You're not just students. Okay, you're students, good. But you're more than students. Uh, the good news is we don't have 10,000 instructors here. <clears throat> but you are more than students. I mean, I hear Paul saying that to them. You are lamb seed. You are, you are, you are the embodiment of Christ crucified. embodiment. Uh, that means the body of Christ crucified. That means the spirit that is Christ crucified, if it is the eternal spirit, the selfless, self-giving spirit of God, then you're the body of it. The body of Christ. We, we're more familiar with that. We like the term the body of Christ more than we like the term the body of Christ crucified. <laughs> and yet it's really one and the same thing. It's not two different things. It is Christ living in us in the way that he lives according to his nature and his spirit. So, Paul is saying here, I, saying to these that he sees as more than students, he says that I have fathered you, and here it comes, after a, I have fathered you after a certain kind of seed and kind. After a certain, not just, you got born again, I led you to the Lord. you see the difference? Big difference. <laughs> you know, there's probably some there that he didn't lead to the Lord. There's a good chance Apollos came in later and led a bunch of them to the Lord. But he's saying, when I came to you, I fathered you. I didn't just instruct you. And I fathered you into a certain kind of family and a certain kind of family spirit and a certain kind of self-giving seed. And his conclusion of that, clearly that's what he's saying in verse 15, and we, we can grasp that when we re read verse 16, wherefore, which means it's a continuation of verse 15, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. If I am your father in the Lord, then follow me into the ways and into the manner of the kind we are out from. Christ goes, that's what he's saying. Remember all that went, we didn't even read it all here, but, um, you know, we are fools, you are wise, we are weak, you are strong, you are honorable, we are despised. <laughs> Foolish to the world, but, and here's the way I, you know, here's the way I come to it. <clears throat> if that's, if that's, you know, I realize that the name Jesus was a label more than a recognition of the person. For me, I'm talking about years ago. I went, you know, that's a label. I don't know who Jesus is. I want to know Jesus. I want to know 
what's behind those letters. And, um, and I'll be honest with you, my early seeking wouldn't, you know, would not have been happy with what I found. <laughs> Meaning, in my early desire to know Jesus with all of my searching of the scripture, with all my pressing in, I would have preferred my enemies to be the fools and me to be wise. Me to be strong and them to be weak. Me to be honorable and them to be despised. And I would have, I could have done that in the Lord, in my understanding. You can't do that in the Lord, but <laughs> I mean, you really can't. But you can do it in you claiming the Lord. You know. And I would have been perfectly happy with that and felt righteous and good and really clean when in reality I'm bathing in the wisdom of this age. And I was, I was, I was, and I admit it. But then, you know, dumb me, I still want more of the Lord, so I keep pressing in and I keep pressing and I keep pressing. And I began to see what he's really like. And I realized when he said, turn the other cheek, he meant that in a certain spirit, not as an act in itself. And when he said, go the extra mile, he meant demonstrate my spirit, the one that you are fathered out of. And of course, we know God is our father and call no man father and all that kind of stuff, okay? So don't call me father. Daddy, that'll be okay, but not father. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yes, Carolyn. Yeah, uh, between instructors and father, you know, it's the relationship. And instructors can instruct but have no intimacy with those he instructs, whereas a father has a special intimacy. Sure, sure. And I think, you know, I think the impartation is huge of imparting out of who he is. And uh, part of that is done by intimacy and part of that is done by seed, you know. And, uh, but both are, both are there and both are necessary because you hear Paul's heart. I mean, he's been, it's almost like, there are places in this book that he, he tries to instruct them. Okay. But, but I think less than what we think because Christ crucified really is his goal. But he sounds like Mr. Instructor sometimes. But then he falls into this and he goes, man, you, you know, I begot you in the gospel. We're one in this. Don't you know what you're of? And let's go on in this. But no, you're choosing up sides and you're saying I'm of him and that all this tearing down of the temple is going on and it's breaking his heart just like it broke Jeremiah's heart, folks. We call Jeremiah the weeping prophet, but maybe we never see the heart of Paul. I don't know. So, you know, wherefore, if I've begotten you in this, wherefore, I beseech you, there you hear that intimacy, there you hear that heart reaching out. Be ye followers of me. And that's, we dealt with this last time I touched on these scriptures, but that's akin to 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where it says, be ye imitators of me, because I'm imitating Christ crucified. Okay. So, uh, verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now I want to tell you, I have read that, that verse. Um, Deb, could you get me a tissue up there, please? Maybe there's one close and I don't see it. But anyway, I've read that verse and I, you know, I, I must admit to you 
that I had the ability to read scripture like it's like I was reading uh, you know the Constitution or something of the United States. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have the ability at times to sit down and read, and it's like I'm not reading about. Abraham, the father of faith, but Abraham Lincoln or something else, some other that I'm just reading, you know, but even more, more like uh, corporate law. That's a, that's better right there. Corporate law. That's what I'm, it's like sometimes. And, I, and I'll tell you another thing, honestly, by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit in my life and, you know, at times, I catch myself and, and basically will say, no, you cannot read that like that. He's trying to communicate something, and you're not going to get anything out of it looking at it like that. Take some time and ask your father to speak to you. <clears throat> and so I notice, you know, it's real easy to notice in verse 16 when he says, wherefore... I beseech you be your followers, followers of me, right? Doesn't wherefore signal you that if I am your father, wherefore, I'm asking you. I'm not rebuking you as a father. I'm beseeching you, follow me in this spirit. Pretty easy to see that. But verse 17 begins with, for this cause. Well, those are pretty powerful words, aren't they? You know, wherefore, and then he goes, well, and for this cause, wherefore referring to what I'm about to tell you and, and beseech you into, but for this cause relates to what he, action he has done to bolster the spirit that he's talking about there. And he says, for this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son in the f and faithful. Another family member, another equal kind. Y you know what I'm saying? Because if, if, if the Corinthians were begotten by Paul in that spirit, how much more Timothy, who packed up everything and came along and lived his life side by side with Paul. Does that make sense? And said, I'm sold out to this. <laughs> you know. So Paul is sending help. Not another instructor. Amen? Not another instructor. Um, but because of him wanting them to comprehend the spirit thereof, Christ crucified, Paul declares that it, it is to this end, therefore, that I send unto you my kind, my seed, my son, Timothy. All right. All right now let's think about that. Well, let me send somebody that knows the message. <laughs> uh, folks, I hear a clarion call going out to us right here at New Creation in Acts is that uh, Paul is not about sending somebody who knows the message. He's trying to bring people into a spirit of a certain kind in a certain way, and he is walking the tightrope to make sure I'm doing everything that I can to release something of reality and not just instruct you. Not just be one of 10,000. You could say that Paul is trying to make a difference. Couldn't you? He really wants people to be, I love this word, transformed. Transformed. My God, how many of us here wouldn't love to have an experience of transformation? <laughs> Hallelujah. You know? 
So we ought to be elbowed right up against Paul going, yes, brother. Do things that are going to bring transformation and not talk. Not just talk. Not more talk. <clears throat> and I love what he says after that because that's, that's perfect what he says. But he goes on to say, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways. He didn't say my teachings. Isn't that beautiful? He, you know, I mean, it is. Because he really wants transformation. Because he really wants Christ crucified. Because he believes that that is the reception of the gospel. And to bring you into the remembrance of my ways. He didn't say, now, Timothy is one of the best teachers we got, and man, he's going to wow you when he comes. You know, you could be a great teacher and not really be effective in transformation for anybody. Did you know that that's possible? Yes, did you have your hand? He's talking about my beloved son first, and then came from the Lord, is that he's releasing his spirit to the family. You know, there's something that someone comes to you and it's your brother or your sister, somebody that's related to you. You're going to listen to them, acknowledge them, and it's going to really, because they, they touch your life deeply versus someone who just doesn't know you, uh, you know, just uh, an acquaintance. So I think it's significant that he says that because, again, he's releasing that spirit of the family. We're all one. We're in this together. I mean, so that you're not taking sides here, but he's your adversary and I'm here to have him set things in order like right. you know, bad people you or something like that, you know, like you can you. But it's like, there's an approach in this. And yeah. it's like, and how much more so, they felt intimidated by Paul, now I'm saying you're, you're brother in the Lord. Let's take a one step, and I totally agree with that. That's exactly right. That's what happened and must happen. Let's look at one step higher, and I'll just read a little to you and see if you can grasp the one step higher than that. Right out of verse 17. Timothy, who, I, I, I'm going to add this. It's not actually added. I'm dropping it down into place. Timothy, whom I send unto you, my beloved son. My beloved son, I send unto you, my beloved son. That's it. That's it. See, he, he is so in tune with the Godhead and so in tune with the Lord that he can't send Timothy the best teacher or the best minister or the best anything. He's got to send his beloved son. <laughs> he's, he's just involved in this and when he says father he knows it's not him it's the father and when he says son he knows it's not just a son it's the son and when he does it he does it all all in the spirit of Christ crucified he has somehow his mind you, you know how hard it is to break out of religious thinking don't you my God somehow this guy did it he, he, it's like a, it's like there was a brick wall of, of religion in his head that he'd been trained from, for, from a child, and this freight train going 100 miles an hour called Christ Crucified smashed into that and splattered it everywhere and then rested on the inside of him. The wisdom of God in a mystery Christ crucified. And that's what Paul said, that's what we preach. And that's what he lived. And, and the other thing that I saw about this is when he said to bring you into remembrance of my ways, he already told you just a few verses up what his ways were. Um, we're fools. They're wise. We're weak. You are strong. You're honorable. We are despised. All right. Now, again, why would anybody accept this unless, unless there's a couple of things that they've seen? One, this is God. 
and to conform to the image of Christ is to conform to this. But see, you can't just hear me say that and accept that. That can't be the way this thing works. You have to see that, and if you see it, you'll be fine. If you don't, something's going to happen down the road, and you won't be fine. You know what I mean? And, um, and then the other thing is, and I'm sure there's a thousand other things you, that would help to see. My little pitiful little brain only sees two right at this moment. But the other thing would be that we believe with all of our heart, we have faith of Hebrews 11, that life comes out of death. And that we believe that. And that we are sold out to that. And, and you know, I mean, <clears throat> folks, believe in a doctrine that life comes out of death is one thing, isn't it? Being confronted with the potential of fighting back or laying down your life when if you don't fight back, you're going to be despised and you're going to be dishonorable in the face of people. You're going to be buffeted. You're going to be reviled. All of those things are going to come. How? I mean, this is my question. How much do you believe life comes out of death? And that's where you'll find out, you know. And, I, and let me just say this. It's okay to fail. Because Paul did. And I know this other Christian guy big shot. His name's Randy. He failed. And that wasn't the end of it. That's the neat thing about our father. <laughs> you know, that I could actually, or you could actually learn from those things and go, oh my God, I mean, you know, and, and sink, down, sink down into the deepest despair that I didn't go with the Lord when I had the opportunity and I hate myself and I da-da-da-da, not realizing that if you are sincere and if you want the Lord, he'll bring it back around again. But between him bringing it, but between the arrival date and where you're at right now is time to get into the word and press in and so that you can see. see it's one thing to embrace this teaching sitting in a chair and, you know, it, it's a, another thing to embrace it in the face of this kind of stuff. Well, here we go again. Don't embrace it if you're not there. Jim was talking about this last Sunday or Sunday before last, you know. I mean, and I told, we had a little talk afterwards, and I told him, look, you know, if you don't, I mean, the, the day Jesus died on the cross was called the hour and power of darkness. That was the devil's biggest day. And Jesus didn't resist him at the cross. He laid down his life and won the victory over principalities and powers, right? Is that true? All right. But if if you don't understand this reality and the devil comes to buffet you, I suggest you resist the devil and he will flee from you. And when I'm praying for people that I know don't really have a full grasp of this, I rebuke the fire out of the devil. Did you know that? Some of you know that. Some of you have been around me enough to know. I have absolutely no problem with demons in you, me, or around me, or us. or I will whip the fire out of them because I know my authority in Christ. But folks, there's a greater power than, than authority over. That authority over will win some battles. The power which is Christ crucified wins the war. And it's the truth. And it is the truth. But don't, you know... But don't think you know it, you know, and you got a little, you got a few little scriptures and you go, oh, Randy got me excited. <laughs> and the Goliath comes out and you come out with this little bitty sword and go, I rebuke, you know, or I'm not, I rebuke you, but I'll, you know, I'm going to die on the, the cross. And your cross is this little tiny thing. He will ravage you. Don't fool around with this kind of stuff. 
know your authority, and then after that, know your right to be able to lay down your life and see the glory of God. That life comes out of death. All right. So, what did I just say? I gave you permission not to go with anything I'm teaching. Did you hear that? <laughs> Especially if you're going to end up in trouble. <laughs> All right, so he's saying, my son, my beloved son, who's going to come to you. And he's going to bring you into remembrance of my ways. He's going to show you my, or remind you of my ways of laying down your life, taking the lower seat, and doing it joyfully. Because if you're in remembrance of it, there's a spirit. There's a spirit that gives you the freedom to lose, knowing the glory of God that's going to come. Okay, well, again, if you don't have that spirit, stop trying to act like you do. Because you're just going to get run over by a Mack truck. <laughs> so, you know, and you'll know it pretty quick. You know, I mean, David walked out against Goliath, you know, and he said, you know, you know the, this, this battle's already won. The battle belongs to the Lord. Well, that's the cross. That's the cross. <clears throat> so... Um, and then in the last part of that verse, he says, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. He claims that this teaching of Christ crucified is what he teaches everywhere. He teaches in every church. What does that mean to us? Just sit, you know, right, right here. Well, it means that what we're getting out of Corinthians probably was preached to the Ephesians, too. <laughs> I mean, does that everywhere in every church? And to the churches in Galatia, too. And Rome. And everywhere. That's what he says. Everywhere. Where, what does that echo from something we heard earlier? Well, it echoes... From 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, I am determined, out and out, full-blown determined, not to know anything among you save Christ and him crucified. <clears throat> and he is determined. Also, you can hear it in his words, not to talk the talk, but to walk the walk. You know what I mean by that. Not just to preach the message. He is so, you can, I'm, I'm sorry, I see that he is really not promoting the message at all. He is really so desirous to be a link between them and God, like Christ was. And he's dying, he's laying down his life, he's doing everything he knows in Christ in Christ crucified, to be that link. And again, when he says, I have fathered you, he knows where that came from. It came from the Lord. He's fathered them in Christ crucified. So he's just a, a conduit. And then, as I said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, you know, be ye imitators of me while I imitate Christ crucified. And he, he's always... He's, he's linking himself between them, but there is no, you understand, there is no true mediator. Christ is the mediator, but he's the conduit of Christ. You see that? He's the conduit of that. So anyway, um, let's, let's just close. We'll come back for our second go-round.